next uh, guest speaker is Raneem. She was um, my coworker at Disability Rights California, and she was one of the main reasons that I even visited my downtown office because I hate driving and trying to find parking in downtown San Diego. And because her name worked there, I made it a point to visit as often as I could because I wanted to pick her brain about what does accessibility mean. I wanted to talk to her about her experiences in the deaf culture. I wanted to hear from her what her ideas were. And one of the first events that I um, created was the Binational Health Week event at the Dojo Cafe in October. And she came up with this brilliant idea to have an art activity that would teach kids and their parents and anyone who wanted to create art how to read and make braille. And she also is the one that shared with me about the, the upcoming trend and the need to change that ADA logo, the one with the wheelchair that's just sitting there, um, because people in wheelchairs are not just sitting there. They're very active in the community, uh, doing work, enjoying themselves. Something that is in Mary's bio is she skydives, she skis, she, I've seen her do yoga. Um, so Mary, uh, Renee is the one that shared with me like there is a movement to make that wheelchair symbol be slightly slanted forward to say that someone is in motion. Um, Renee is the one that inspired me to keep learning and keep growing and um, because of her I believe that there's always something to learn and I'm so excited for all of you to hear Renee share her story. So without further ado, Renee. Hello everyone, my name is Renim and my sign name is this, and thank you so much for having me here at this event. I really appreciate Linda for the introduction as well. So I, this is going to be very interactive, I like turn taking, so first I'm going to introduce myself and tell you who I am and my background and then we'll open it up. So again, my name is Renim, and that name was given to me from my dad, who is from Palestine, which is in Israel. The name Renim actually means harmony and peace. It was interesting because I'm deaf, Palestinian, American, a refugee. And at that time when I was born, the people in Palestine were experiencing a really, really horrific war, as well as famine. I've struggled with my identity in the past with cultural conflicts. And in Israel, honor is an important concept, family, community, and the like. After I was born, my parents found out that I was deaf, but there's a belief in Palestine that if you're born deaf, it's because you are demonic or a spawn of Satan, possessed by a demon. And so my dad would uh, take me when I was a little girl for a walk, and I remember that I entered a church at one time, and I sat there, and my dad sat on one side, and my mom sat on the other side of me, and there was a priest in front of me who was talking. And then the priest approached me slowly. And he grabbed my hand and motioned for me to come with him. So I went up to the altar with him. And I looked at my parents because I was confused about what I was doing there with the priest. And the priest started to shake me, shake my head back and forth and to, to get, pour holy water on me and, and to shout these blessings in my direction. And I was so embarrassed and I felt really awkward. I started to cry at that moment. I remember the priest throwing me forward and looking at the audience. And my parents didn't help me in that moment as I lay on the floor. I felt 
extremely embarrassed and vulnerable in that situation. And I realized that they were trying to heal me, trying to make me hearing. And that's when I started the first identity conflict, that I was not proud to be a deaf person. I didn't want to communicate with friends or family. I didn't want to be involved because I didn't want to be embarrassed again. If my own family was embarrassed of me, then I felt embarrassed of myself. I want to tell you a story, if I can, about a little girl. She sat at the table one day, surrounded by family, eating a dinner. And as she was eating, all of a sudden, the family dispersed. They started screaming, yelling, hiding underneath the table. And the little girl looked from side to side because she didn't know what was going on. She was so confused. The dad grabbed her leg and pulled her under the table with him. And then there was a mass explosion. There was smoke everywhere. It was foggy. The little girl's eyes were so foggy she couldn't see. She was about 10 at the time. She crawled underneath the table, being scratched by the various debris. She didn't know what was going on. And then she saw the big hole in the wall. Now there was a neighbor boy who was both deaf and blind, about six years old. And the little girl saw the boy crawling looking for his parents, for his siblings, and only finding limbs, an arm, or a leg. And the girl could see this boy through the hole in the wall. And the boy started to cry because being deaf and blind, he didn't know what was going on. And the little girl's father called her and said, we have to leave, and grabbed her by the arm and started running outside. Now there was a street located right outside of the house and so everyone started running for the street. But the little girl realized that the boy was alone. His family had been killed. And so she looked back and saw the boy struggling to find his way out. Now in the streets there was so much chaos because it was the middle of a war so gunfire was rapid. And the little boy was trying to walk and find his way as he got outside the street, the little girl was trying to grab him, but the father was grabbing her in the opposite direction for her safety. And that's when the little girl saw that a bullet hit the boy just as he was crossing the street. And he fell to the ground. No one was there to communicate with him about what was going on. He was there with his family, with his mom, with his dad on a regular day eating dinner. And then all of a sudden, his family was gone in an instant. And he died still not knowing what had happened. That little girl saw that story, and that little girl was me. It was very traumatizing for me to see that happen. And as my dad pulled me out of the wreckage and we ended up leaving Gaza, they didn't allow, we actually weren't allowed to leave at first. They didn't give us any medical supplies. There was barely any food. We left our house, but we were in the middle of wreckage. We would go into some broken homes, broken down homes, and we would see explosions one after the other that caused holes in the wall. Luckily, I was able to make it out with my father alive from our home. My mom was lost at that time. She went in one direction while my father and I ran in the other, and that was the last time I saw her for a long time. It was very traumatizing to lose, to lose your family in an instant like that and, and not to really be aware of what was going on. I remember feeling so confused because that's my home. That's my family. I had family members who died. Why were we leaving them? Why couldn't we go back home? All of those questions were unanswered, one, or very unanswered. And so it was a conclusion that was hard for me to deal with. 
we ended up coming to America, and I really was in a state of cultural shock. America is so different from Palestine. I know Arabic, I know Israeli sign language, which was my natural language. That was my identity as a little girl. But then coming to America, I had to learn English, which was a completely different language. And then ASL, instead of ISL, I had to learn American Sign Language. When I first went to school, for the first time in many years, because in Gaza, our school had been destroyed during the war. So when I first got to school in America, I was very excited to learn. And the teacher said, okay, who wants to read the first chapter? And I looked around, and she looked directly at me, of course. And so I opened the book, and I read from right to left. And the teacher said, um, excuse me, we, you got to open the book this way, and we start reading on the left side of the page instead of the right. That was new for me, another cultural shock. I felt like everything was backwards here. Now, the medical field in Gaza was non-existent. I would use my grandmother or my aunts who knew how to deliver babies or get medicine or uh, cousins who knew how to perform uh, simple surgeries or procedures. That was our medical field. So coming to America and seeing an actual hospital with real doctors and psychologists and nurse and counselors was new for me. They had audiologists here. And I was taken to the audiologist at one point, and I remember entering the office and feeling very unsure of what was going on. And they put me in some type of box. I remember sitting in the box, and there was a woman who put this device in my ears and hooked it up to these wires, and I didn't know what to do. And then I saw a monkey over there, and that kind of scared me. It was like a, a, a TTY. What was that going on in, in the corner? And I sat there, and... I remember being alone as they closed the door, left me in this box, feeling like I was imprisoned. And I started to have anxiety, and my heart started to race. And I looked out of the window at the woman's face, and she was doing whatever she was doing on her computer, and I didn't know why I was there. There was no sign language interpreter to tell me what I was doing. It was just me alone in the box. I would hear these vibrations and feel these vibrations, and feel very alone. She gave me this button and I wasn't sure what to do with it and the woman would roll her eyes in exasperation and walk in and say, hey, when you hear something, try to click something. And I couldn't hear anything. So I felt very isolated, like I was an abnormal experiment. And that really showed me Audiologists sometimes can be very unfriendly. They didn't help me understand what was going on. It was my first time in this type of environment. They forced a hearing aid on me. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't used to that. And so again, it was a cultural thing that I felt unsure about. There was no instruction, no communication like there was in the Middle East. Here we had a profession, but there was no instruction. There was no explanation. Before, at least my family would try to gesture and tell me what was going on, but here I was sitting in this box and I'm supposed to click this thing and I had no idea what was going on. I think my experience would have been improved if I had a sign language interpreter who was there, who understood what I was going through, that could give me the access to the language that I needed that could tell me before I entered the box what was happening so I knew what to expect. So I wouldn't feel so dark and alone and imprisoned and forced to hook up to all these medical devices. I am a deaf interpreter myself, and I'll explain later on what that actually means. We have hearing interpreters, like you can hear now, they're voicing for me as I'm signing. And it's really important that when you meet a deaf person, you establish eye contact with them. Because I'm speaking to you, not the interpreters. We're just borrowing their voices. 
So you can hear them, and that enables you to understand what I'm saying, but we just borrow them as voices for us to have access, but really the ideas originate with me. Now a deaf interpreter, which is what I do secularly, let me go back a little bit. We may have a client who comes from another country who may be a refugee or maybe never was, you know, exposed to education and may have a lack of language. And so even though they have a hearing interpreter, sometimes the communication can be difficult. But because I'm deaf and was born deaf and my first language is sign language and I'm used to gesturing, I can sit with this individual, I can draw, I can act out or gesture different things that can help them to understand the information. It helps the light bulb to go off, as it were, in the deaf mind. And so it's really important that those of you in the medical field understand what a deaf person is going through. And if you don't, stop and take a moment to think, what do they need to get access to communication? There's another story I would like to tell you. It happened in 2010 when I fell and broke my back. It was actually December 6th at 4.30 in the afternoon. I remember it exactly. I was very excited, ready to hide the presents from my sister. And as I was walking, I walked down the stairs and ended up falling and felt a pop in my back and it ended up breaking. And I remember not being able to see clearly. I think I passed out for some amount of time and the EMTs and the paramedics arrived. And they tried to gesture with me. They pointed at what was wrong and, and where I had fallen. And they put me on the stretcher. And then the other EMT was showing me where I was going to go and they hauled me into the back of the, the truck and we were on our way to the hospital. I remember entering the hospital into the emergency room and laying there on my back and there was nothing but white lights above me. And I was in excruciating pain. I hadn't been given any medicine or anything. I remember yelling. I was in a brace so I couldn't move. I was strapped to the stretcher, fearing very immobile and with no sign language interpreter there. At that time, I didn't even have my hearing aids on, so I was completely shut off from communication. I remember lying there, and eventually they had to put me in some type of MRI machine and, and draw blood, and one nurse was trying to communicate that I had broken my back, and another nurse ended up coming in and telling me to put on a gown, and I was telling her that my back was hurting, but I didn't know how to do that without just gesturing, and she thought that I was just complaining as some type of person that was in there just to say what was wrong, and so she ended up pulling me, and I could feel my spine stretching even further apart with a back that was already broken, and all I could do was scream. I felt like my body, my entire being was on fire, and I was so upset, I just started to cry. And the nurse ended up leaving me, not even asking me what was wrong or any type of follow-up questions. And I know that the emergency room can be busy, but can you think from my experience or from my perspective what I was going through? I don't go to the emergency room every day. I'm sure many of them were in similar situations where nurses had to take turns helping various patients but it's scary for an individual who's not used to that environment. And for someone in pain, it's so important to have a sign language interpreter there to make it easier. Can you imagine that I did not have a sign language interpreter for three entire days in the hospital? And when an interpreter finally arrived three days later, I just started to cry. I asked them, why am I here? Why can't I move? Why am I stuck in bed? What happened? Why are the nurses drawing blood? What's going on? Am I sick? And when they finally told me that I had broken my back, it wasn't until three days after it happened. I didn't even know what was going on with my own medical condition. I didn't know why my legs couldn't move. I wasn't sure what was happening.
they put something across my, my, my chest, to, uh, some type of corset to allow me to be able to walk down the hall during physical therapy. I was able to use a walker and try to go one step at a time. And I remember an older person about 95 years old. I, I don't know if that's how old she actually was, but I'm just approximating her age. And she was next to me and she was like, you're doing good, girl. And she was walking in the walker next to me. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I'm worse than a 90 year old. I'm trying to play catch up with her. That was one of the good moments. She actually made me inspired. I realized I got to beat this 90-year-old, and that inspired me to try to walk even faster. And all the interpreters and doctors and nurses laughed with me at that moment. But it showed with the use of a sign language interpreter advocating for me, supporting me, making sure I understood what was going on, what my method for treatment was, making sure I responded appropriately, making sure I didn't have any brain damage. All of that was so crucial. The only difference between me and any other patient was that I use sign language. I'm just like any other person, except I just use a different language. When you work with ASL interpreters in various settings, there's some things I want you to keep in mind. Language barriers can really be hindering and you need to think about that in healthcare. When you get a, a patient and you realize that they're deaf or hard of hearing, you need to ask them what they need. Don't just assume that they always use sign language. They might prefer a different type of language accents. For example, they might prefer to write back and forth to communicate. Or maybe they use video remote in, or relay interpreting. And that's where you have the screen where the interpreter's on the screen in the actual hospital setting. Sometimes they actually use a different type of sign language. Like for example, we have many, many spoken languages that you're aware of, Arabic, Spanish, English, and the like. And we have a variety of sign languages. We have American Sign Language, Middle Eastern Sign Language, Brazilian Sign Language, Australian Sign Language, British Sign Language, and so it's important to ask the deaf person, what language do you need? And when you find the language of their preference, that's when you make the request to get an interpreter there. And it actually makes your job so much easier because with the interpreter beside you, they're there to support you and to make sure that the client has communication access. We are your colleagues as interpreters. We're not inferior, we're not superior, we're equal. And just like you have doctors, and you have counselors, and you have psychologists that are your colleagues, we as interpreters are part of your medical team to service the patients that you see. Have any of you guys worked with deaf people before? Can I get a show of hands to see if you've ever had deaf clients in the past? OK, several of you have. Who's never met a deaf person? Or maybe I'm the first deaf person you've ever seen. You are, there's several deaf actually in the room, but can you raise your hand if you've never worked with a, a deaf person before? Okay, several hands. Now before I go on with my presentation, I'd like to just open up it up for audience discussion. Are there any questions that you have about deaf patients or the deaf community at large? For those of you who are new to the deaf community, are there any questions that I can answer for you? Yes. Yes, yes. If you look at San Diego Retreat Organization, Refugee um, Organization, they have an online um, beautiful website with amazing articles and books that they recommend. The Silence with the Night is one of the books that talks about refugees that are deaf specifically. And they talk about their experiences, their journeys, moving to a different country, and it's a wonderful book that I recommend. But look at their entire website, the San, San Diego Refugee website, and they have a lot of articles. Are there any other questions? I think I saw someone over here with their hand raised.
Yes. Well, now we have technology, so texting is always an option. You can text what you want to say. When you approach a deaf person, you can wave, gesture, hello, smile is always nice. And you can ask them, do you want to write or do you want to text? And they can look. Most deaf people are thrilled when someone wants to communicate with them honestly. So they would be happy to indulge. So, yeah, I think that's the best way. And we wouldn't be offended at all. Just come up to us, approach us. I'd rather you approach us than make us feel isolated, you know. Don't just look at us from across the room. But come up and engage us. We're just another human being like you. So feel free to approach us at any time. Yes, and someone there? Now, if someone wants to get the attention of a person who can't hear, they would come to the back, correct, and then tap them on the back? Okay, yeah, that's, that's right. You can tap me on the shoulder, but just be gentle with your taps. I know because if you're, like, you know, using all uh, your entire fist on our back, we're like, oh, my goodness, are you mad at us? Are you slapping us? What's going on? So as long as you do it in a nice way, that's a great way to get our attention. Yeah, sometimes people are nervous, and so their taps kind of feel like a police knock or something. But, yeah, just go really lightly. And, uh, or sometimes not too lightly because then we'll be like, is that a fly on our shoulder? You know, so just a medium tap is fine. Yeah, just little things like that. Yes, did you want to say something? I see a lot of talk about person first language. What kind of I personally prefer you to recognize me as deaf first because I'm proud to be a deaf person. And that's my identity. And so during this, um, we talk about um, the different disability rights. Like they might say like um, the girl or Raneem, she's a girl who has this job, blah, 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 right? For me, I would rather them say this deaf woman named Raneem who works at such and such place. Because I believe that deafness is not a disability, it actually is part of my identity. And so I'm proud to recognize that. Oops, I dropped my mic, just one moment. Oh, I can't talk, but <laughs> put it back on the table. <laughs> okay, so did that answer your question? Yeah, and then what about you? That's a really, really good question. And that actually dives into what I'm going to talk about later. It parallels perfectly. Right now, we struggle with the education system, to be honest with you. Um, it's really unfair to a lot of deaf children. And I'll explain why in just a moment. But um, if you have a child who enters the school system and who is deaf, And they all have different backgrounds. Like, for example, um, you maybe have this girl who learned ASL later in life. And then you have someone who's just learning ASL at the moment. You may have another girl who has hearing parents. And so she's trained to be oral at home and lip read. But remember, that's not 100% successful. We usually get about 30% of what you're saying. So can you imagine the 70% that deaf people usually miss when you, they're, they're just relying on lip read? And that's a question we get all the time. Can you read my lips is what people ask us. And sometimes it's just a waste of time. So I would recommend not doing that. Um, and you can spread the word not to ask deaf people, can you read my lips? <laughs> and then, um, I mean, you really get a, a wide variety of deaf kids. So for example, in fourth grade, you have a classroom with all these various individuals with different backgrounds. You have someone who's struggling to understand, someone who's way behind. And then at the end of the year, the teacher says, oh, you guys are all good enough. Okay, graduate to fifth grade. But really, what did they learn? What about the kid who was behind during the entire school year that was struggling to understand because of language barriers? And so the, the teacher just allows them to pass from grade to grade to grade, but not really allowing them to have appropriate access or one-on-one -on -one education or making sure that they're appropriate grade level. And we have ASL interpreters there, but we really need to have different groups for different learning styles. So that would be really crucial because it's unfair that, I mean, there's some deaf that are very, very intelligent. They just need a sign language interpreter and they can be in a mainstream class. Like I was tutored when I was younger and I um, 
didn't really have school education growing up um, in the Middle East, and then I came to America, and I struggled for a while, so I had to have a tutor to catch up to my grade. And there's different resources that I would offer. Like if you go to Lead K on Google, you will find a lot of good resources that are located there, and I would encourage you to research about the different avenues to help with children, the dynamics in the classrooms and the teachers and the counselors and how everyone can team together and all the resources that are in play when educating a deaf child. Also, Street Leverage has a variety of professionals there, interpreters who can tell you their experiences and how they navigate with deaf children in the education system. So many of you already know what an IEP is, right? An individual educational plan. Um, and so that meeting that's held for a child every year includes the teacher and the principal and the counselors and various staff. But it's really about the student and their development and their success, what their goals are for the year. And that meeting is so crucial, but at the same time, it's important to understand why is there not an ASL interpreter provided for the child during that IEP meeting? It's not just for the adults, right? There's someone signing for the adults, but we're talking about the child. We're talking about their future. If we had a hearing child in the room, they would have access to all the information. They, they could look around and see what everybody's talking about. But why are deaf children exempt? Why are they not included in that meeting by having ASL access? Do we even ask them how they feel about their IEP plan? Are they in agreement with the goals that you've established for the school year? And some of you, I can see by your expressions, you're like, oh my goodness, I've never thought about that before. But it's true because that's what happens all the time. The child knows best what they need and what's going to help them learn. And so they need to know when they're in class, maybe the teacher turns to write something on the board, right? And the child is lost because they were looking at the teacher's lips to understand, but now the teacher has their back to them. How can they understand what the teacher's saying? And that's why an ASL interpreter is so important, even in the medical field. And it parallels to the education field as well. Doctors may say, are you sexually active? And the parents answer for their children, no, 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 they're not sexually active. They've never had sex before. But the child's looking at their parent responding for them and never had access to the question. So sometimes an interpreter is there and the interpreter will stay, say to the doctor, it seems that the child may like to add something to this question. And then the doctor would know to ask the parents to please be excused from the room because they have the interpreter present to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one communication with the child. And sometimes the answer is opposite of what the parents thought it would be. So it's very important to ask the individual. Don't ask the people around the deaf individual. Like when you talk to me, you look directly at me, not my interpreters, right? And so the same is, is, is true in the doctor's office or in a senior citizen home or in a, a classroom setting. Ask the deaf individual what they need because they would know the answer best. Does that satisfy your question? Yeah? Okay. Are there any qu other questions before I go on? Okay, I understand your question. So let me just clarify. Uh, you said you're at a store, like maybe at a cashier or, or something, and the deaf person is trying to communicate, um, or the cashier is trying to communicate with the deaf person. I've experienced that many times myself personally, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And the cashier may be trying to say something, maybe I thought it was discounted, and now they're charging me full price. And so, you know, we're at disagreement at the cashier, um, at the register. And so I may be confused in that moment. And the person behind me may know sign language, and so they may tap me and say, do you need help? And I'm like, yes, please, right? I don't understand what she's saying. But suppose I tell them, no, I don't need help. Then that would be the time for them not to be involved because that would be oppressing me as an individual if I say I don't need your help. So I like to be independent, 
And it depends really on the situation. Always ask the deaf person what they need first, and then we will give you a response, either yes or no, and you can go from there. Yeah. I know it's tough. All of us are just big-hearted, and we want to help and be involved. But the moment that you take over a deaf person, you disempower them and really oppress them. And that's not just at the cash register, but in any example, when you make decisions for them. Like if a deaf person's in a wheelchair, going up a hill, and they're struggling, and you see them struggling, and you just take over the wheelchair, and like, let me just push you up the hill. But the wheelchair is part of their body, as it were, right? It's part of their physical being. And so by you touching that, and not asking their permission, you're invading their personal space. So why not ask them, hey, do you need help up this hill or do you want to do it on your own? They may just say, oh, no, I like the exercise. Thank you. Right? So deaf people are not just like me all the time. Some use wheelchairs. Some are deaf blind. Like the Palestinian boy I talked about at the beginning of my story, he was deaf blind. And many of you are familiar with the story of Helen Keller, right? I'm sure by the nods of the heads that you guys are. And so we have a huge community of deaf all over the nation who are also limited with vision and may be deaf blind. They may use tactile interpreting where someone actually signs into their hands. And they are so intelligent. They can communicate. We have interpreters that have post-secondary education. They may have um, master's degrees and PhDs even though they're deaf blind. So, if you meet a deafblind individual, you can again tap them on the shoulder, sign into their hand if you know sign language. If you have an interpreter there, please utilize the interpreter to communicate with them. And I'm not sure if there's anything else. Eric, did you want me to add anything about the deafblind community? I know you're aware of some things as well. Yes, that's right. We had one deafblind lawyer. Thank you so much for reminding me. Yes. So that was amazing. And where was that? Northern California, correct? Yes. Yes. No. Washington, D.C. Okay. Okay. So I just want to make sure I covered all the points that I had set out to talk about. Okay. Now this one is a really, really crucial, a crucial point. How many of you speak a second language by a show of hands? Okay. Now, if you're in a meeting, and let's say you're being represented as a counselor or you're an advocate, because that's what we're talking about, right? Equal access. So you may be an advocate. And then you notice that there's an individual, and maybe the mom is speaking Spanish, and she speaks Spanish, and then you notice there's another individual who's deaf there, and you know they use sign language. Do you play dual roles as the interpreter and the advocate at the same time in this meeting? What do you guys think? Who thinks yes by a show of hands? You should do dope, dual roles during that meeting. Okay, who says no? Okay. That is correct. You never play dual roles during that type of situation. Never, ever, ever. For example, and this has happened in the past to a friend of mine, there was a mother who was deaf who had two hearing children. The baby was about six months old, and the little boy was about seven. They went into the hospital. And they were admitted to the room, and the doctor says, wow, you have a really serious problem. And she starts explaining that it's really an emergency. You're going to need surgery. And during that entire process, they were using the seven-year-old boy to interpret for the mother. Tell your mom it's an emergency. Tell your mom what's going on. Can you imagine? Why would a doctor do that? And the little boy's like, oh, mom, we have to go. You have surgery right now. I don't understand what's going on, but the doctor says... It's an emergency. And during all of that chaos, the nurses and the doctors admitting the mom, taking her off to the emergency room, they all forgot about the two children in the room and ended up closing the doors as they wheeled the mom off to surgery. And one nurse 
walking down the hall, realizes that she hears some crying. And as she opens the door, she sees the two boys that have been in the room for six hours because the mom had to have serious emergency surgery. And they found out that the baby had actually been vomiting and aspirated and passed away. And that little boy was sitting there crying, holding his baby sibling because he wasn't tall enough to open the door. So imagine a mom waking up from surgery and asking, where are my children? And the doctor saying, what children? And she's saying, the kids that were with me when I first came into the hospital, being extremely upset and an interpreter coming on to the scene last minute and trying to figure out what's going on, asking what kind of, what kid she's talking about because the interpreter was called six hours later and hadn't known about any of the previous activities that had occurred. And so she's saying, I did have two kids, and so the interpreter is going to the charge nurse on saying, hey, where are the children? I'm interpreting for her. She's saying she'd had two children, and they're saying, oh, the two kids are downstairs, and they're saying, okay. So the charge nurse had to end up getting someone from administration and telling the mom eventually, imagine through the sign language interpreter that your baby passed away while you were in surgery. Now, if you had utilized a sign language interpreter at the beginning of that scenario, that entire catastrophe could have been avoided because as the boy, the boy wouldn't have had to perform dual, dual roles, first of all, for the mother, which is very, very frightening for a child. And they would have had access to all that information in the beginning before she was wheeled off to surgery. Imagine how the interpreter felt. How heartbreaking to have to tell your client that their child has passed away. I want to talk a little bit about VRI, which is video relay interpreting. If you have a patient who is in the hospital, on bed rest or laying down, waiting for another procedure, and for some reason they can't move, they're just laying in bed, do you think utilizing an interpreter on a screen would be ideal? Could a deaf patient who was forced to lay down, look to the side to a screen to see sign language? Some of you might say yes. That's not appropriate. The doctors sometimes use a stand and then try to bring the screen over the deaf person's face. But the Wi-Fi sometimes is ineffective. It doesn't run fast enough. There may be a delay with a sign language interpreter through the screen because they're utilizing the internet. And they're saying, oh, that's enough. That's good enough. We're providing equal access for this deaf patient. Because under the ADA law, we have to provide some type of access. So this is good enough. Any reasonable accommodations should be satisfactory. Can you imagine how a lot of deaf people feel in that situation? Many of them don't want to go to the hospital because of that situation. They have interpreters who are on a camera who are freezing. I don't know if you guys recently saw on Facebook or on live TV, but um, I'm sure that's actually gone viral. But I believe it's, uh, it happened in Florida. I'm not sure exactly which state. And there was a VRI interpreter who was on the screen. And the doctor was trying to tell the client that you have a few weeks to live. But the interpreter on the screen was signing, you will die. And it froze before they were able to finish the sentence in a few weeks. So can you imagine at that moment that interpreter seeing the sign die, the deaf person seeing that, and not being able to get the end of the message. And then finally, when the Wi-Fi comes back on, the interpreter finishes sentences, the sentence and says, oh, in two weeks. So VRI can be useful at appropriate times in certain situations. But when it's a serious situation where it's life or death, like the one I just talked about, it's really important to have a live interpreter. You want to respect the wishes of the deaf patient. I know that's kind of a sensitive topic, but before I move on, are there any questions about that? 
and why a video relay interpreter wouldn't be appropriate in some situations. Do you guys have any questions about that? Okay. Now, ASL interpreters don't always know everything, and I will explain that. Sometimes we use um, acronyms, DRC, DCS, things like that. And interpreters need to know the context of every situation, whether it's at court or in a hospital situation or at the OBGYN doctor or at a counselor or in a school setting or at the PhD level. There is a variety of situations that interpreters are in. Now, if an interpreter could know, know everything A to Z about every single subject, why would they even be an interpreter? They should go off and make a lot of money doing something else. But really, interpreters need to work with you to avoid any type of misunderstanding. So make sure you explain exactly what you're talking about. If you say DRC, explain it means Disability Rights California. Because if you just throw an acronym at a deaf person, they may not understand. And the interpreter shouldn't be able to answer that. It should be you who are communicating with the deaf patient and letting them know and explaining what those letters actually mean. You also want to avoid idioms, if you can. That's a big one because Deaf culture and hearing culture are different, so sometimes the, jo the jokes don't translate. Um, it can be very, very difficult, especially jokes based on sound. And make sure you're patient with a sign language interpreter. There's gonna be processing time where you're speaking and the sign language interpreter has to interpret what you're saying. And the deaf client needs to make sure they understand before the sign language interpreter can go on or before they can respond to your question. And then you have the sign language interpreter who's gonna respond for the deaf person in English for you. So make sure that you're patient because it, it definitely takes some time for the interpretation to be correct. Many times, we're all faced with difficult situations. Many of us have different disabilities. Some of us are embarrassed to talk about things that have happened. I like to talk about my identity as a refugee and as a deaf woman and as an American now because some people are like, well, you know, what does that even mean? And I had a lot of struggles with my identity coming here, luckily, because of the ASL interpreters, they made my life a lot easier. I was able to understand the new country, understand what was going on here, go to school, make medical appointments, have a job. And right now, there's a large population of refugees in El Cajon. The population is really expanding. And it's not just El Cajon, it's all over the nation, but here in San Diego especially, the refugee population is increasing. Two years ago, we accepted over 1,000 refugees. And there were 500 deaf among them, going through the immigration process, trying to understand the cultural differences, going through cultural shock, language delays, the different religions here, the different styles and dress and grooming. And the ASL interpreters had to work with those individuals. You have to work with those individuals. So you need to be aware of their trauma and past experiences. If you were to approach a refugee really quickly, they may be triggered. They need to see what's going on before you approach them. If you were to shake their hands, Make sure that it's not too strong. You always wanna show respect and lightly shaking their hand and not showing that you're trying to disempower them. If you sign this, thumbs up, that's actually a cuss word in another language. So some people say thumbs up, but it's actually better to do this, this hand shape. 
So just small cultural differences I could really enumerate and go on and on and on. But ASL interpreters in these various situations and communities are so important. We rely on our sign language interpreters to bridge the gap in communication, to understand our peers, our colleagues, to support our lives, both secular and personal. ASL interpreters are a huge part of the lives of the deaf community. And so I hope this presentation will help you to understand a little bit more about the deaf community. To be patient, to be understanding, and to be human, just like we are. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Raneem. I learned a lot. And every time I hear Raneem share her story, I learn something new about her and her experience and how I can um, be better at the work that I do.